Welcome and thank you for tuning in for this special episode of Beer Guys Radio. Today we're attending the Georgia Craft Brewers Guild's Dreamers Workshop at Gate City Brewing in Roswell, Georgia. The purpose of this workshop is to share valuable information with those looking to open a craft brewery or brew pub. This is part two of a two-part series. In part two, we'll hear from Michael Lundmark of Jekyll Brewing Company, Brian Borngesser of Gate City Brewing, Brandon Hintz of Hop Alley Brew Pub and Currahee Brewing, and CJ Putnicki of New Realm Brewing Company. We'll also have Nancy Palmer with the Georgia Craft Brewers Guild here to share some information. Be sure to check out part one of the series where we'll hear from experts in the legal, banking, and financial industries who'll share information on what you need to know before opening a brewery. Without further delay, let's join our Brewers panel. I'm CJ Putnicki with the New Realm Brewing Company. Um, yeah, we're, we're brand new on the Beltline. And prior to that, I worked with uh, Mitch Steele at Stone Brewing and, and built the uh, Stone Richmond facility. So. I'm Nancy. I'm the executive director of the Georgia Craft Brewers Guild, and I'm your lobbyist as well. Brian Borngesser, uh, CEO and chief bathroom washer at Gate City Brewing. Uh, Brandon Hintz, I own Hop Alley Brew Pub in Alpharetta and Curry Brewing Company in uh, Franklin, North Carolina. I'm Michael Lundmark. I'm the founder of Jekyll Brewing. Thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And There's a lot of faces out here that are looking to start their breweries and coming in here to get the knowledge. And we, we really appreciate you taking the time to come here and share some of uh, what you've gone through in starting your brewery and getting things going, some pitfalls that you may run into. So to kind of start things off, just kind of a, uh, a vague or general question for anyone on the panel, is there one main pitfall that seems to kind of bring new brewers that they fall into when they start their brewery? Oh, I'll jump on that. <laughs> Go for it, um, uh, Generally, when I'm looking at uh, talking to a brewer who wants to open a brewery or looking at a business plan, two of the things that I look for to know that they're a thoughtful, that they really understand the industry is if they have a plan for cooperage, like do you know if you're buying or leasing? Because that's a major line item that most people don't consider. And do you have a plan for water and wastewater? Because those are also major line items that most people don't consider. They need to be considered in your engineering, but also in your in your business plan. And so those are two things that I see that get kind of overlooked and then people go, oh crap, a half barrel costs $150? Yes, it does. <laughs> so that's a couple of things. And then, of course, for me, you know, my job is regulation. So I would love it if everyone who opened knew exactly what the DOA, DOR, and TTB, EPA, FDA, DOL, and... Just memorize all acronyms yeah, related and to and OSHA. Right? There it is. Because of those six, four of them can shut you down when they walk in the door. And so if you don't know what they want and what they're looking for, you're not paying attention. Um, those, are, those are problems that I deal with regularly. And it's something that Pat talked about. If you're not, you can't be compliant all the time, right? When I was driving down here, I was definitely speeding. There are certain laws and rules that you break and skirt, but you need to know where your liabilities are, and you need to know what the regulations are and who can come in and, and really cause harm to your business. Not, not only was she speeding, she cut me off. <laughs> I'll say uh, one thing for us when we uh, when we I've, so I've opened now we've opened Hop Alley uh, Curry and we're opening another Curry um, some of the construction costs I actually came from construction that was my background and uh, there's a couple things that you, when I price out the project uh, I did it myself and I was the GC as well uh, that kind of were gotcha items to say the least. Um, one is, you know, you do your whole brewing system, you get a cost out, you got your, your tanks, everything like that. Uh, there's two points on this. One is if you're doing a steam vessel system, uh, piping. Uh, the, the cost of piping, so whatever your boiler is, expect to add about two times just for piping and insulation. It's, it's absurd. It's a very specialty uh, product and it will bite you in the ass when it comes to breaking your budget. Uh, the other one is glycol piping. Both things. They both get you. And the insulation for glycol piping is just as much as the glycol piping. 
Now you could do something fancy like Cool Fit or Aquatherm or something like that, uh, but that is really high dollar. Uh, we've got Aquatherm in the brewery, and we just actually have Cast Schedule Forty in the brew pub. Uh, Cast is great because it's cheap; it'll get you up and running pretty quickly. You got to insulate it again, expensive, but you got to expect to replace it in about ten years. Now, granted, you know glycol does has a rust inhibitor the, that runs through it, so it's not going to rust your pipes out. But the outside will condensate, and you'll pit it on the outside. So those were my two big things, and then I'd probably say my other was uh, not being a business owner beforehand. Payroll tax. Yeah, that sucks. So, yeah, that that there you go. So when we opened, I actually went over to Brandon and asked him for experience, and he didn't tell me any of that. <laughs> <laughs> and and we were we ran out of money the first time. Uh, on construction costs on our initial build out um, did a Kickstarter campaign to try and backfill it you know uh, ran out of money about seventy four times in the first forty eight months um, and many of those times were around construction costs um, architectural fees on the front of the drawings, the permitting fees, the timeline extensions um, all of those things we didn 't have built into our plan. We had brewing equipment, raw materials you know we knew everything there was to know about beer we thought. Um, separate of the glycol piping and the steam piping. Uh, and then the second time we built, after we sold our first system and outgrew it and put in our second system, it got us again, right? Putting in the boiler and all the regulation around the boiler and the steam piping. Uh, and Brandon didn't tell me anything about any of that the first time, so I'm learning here today, too. <laughs> His heart softened a little bit over yeah. the last few years. He's open to sharing that information. Uh, as I think most everyone here knows, uh, thanks to the hard work of the Guild, Nancy Palmer, Taylor Harper, and some, some of our lawmakers, the laws changed in Georgia last year, allowing breweries to have direct sales. So uh, if you were to go back and do it again, what would you do differently, or what would you recommend to someone starting a brewery now uh, with the new laws in place? That's you, man. He did it after. Yeah. Um, simultaneously. I think the number one thing that I would recommend for people to do, uh, and there was a question about it earlier, is if you can focus, if you can, if you can nail down a prime location with a lot of walkability, a lot of foot traffic, I would make that your number one focus. That's where your margins are going to be. That's where you're going to make your money. Distribution, you know, before you had to. Uh, it was a way to get your product out there. There was a little marketing that was, was thrown into that. You know, if someone had it out at a gas station, maybe you could pull them back to your brewery. Um, but with the new law being what it is uh, and the cost of distribution and the headaches that it can create, uh, if you can focus on your tap room space, I would say 100% go there first and then get into distribution only if you want to. The early numbers coming in, and these numbers are early, but but as it stands right now, what we're looking at is that it takes selling kind of six times as much through wholesale as what you make selling in your tasting room, volume-wise. So it's for every, probably more than that. For, right. For every six to seven beers you sell out in the world, if you sold one in your tasting room, you'd make the exact same amount of money. So those are the multipliers. Again, really early, but that's what, that's what you're looking at. Brandon, follow up for, for you because I know you're in the process right now of changing over. You had a brew pub in Georgia, opened a production brewery in North Carolina. So at the time you opened out of state, was that due to the laws in Georgia? It was, yeah. Um, you know, we had, and it's actually this law is still in effect, and Taylor can sp spoke about it, is that, you know, you can only own one tier of the system. So brew pubs are weird because they're retail with a manufacturer uh, license a part of them to where a brewery is just the manufacturer. So one of the reasons we did hop ship uh, and go to North Carolina is due to that, you know. And then now that that's kind of the whole September first law change is why we're coming back in. Owning a kitchen is not that fun. <laughs> now you know we've talked about how much, pretty much all, all session long, about how much it costs to open a brewery. Everyone's talking about this. So I, I, what is something? that maybe you shouldn't have put, or shouldn't have put as much budget or time in that you wish you had? Like some of the things that maybe some of the lines that are a little bit low, but hey, maybe I should have invested some extra time and money into this instead. I wish we wouldn't have tried to GC the build out ourselves. 
that was a nightmare. We did it. We didn't learn it the first time. Uh, every build out, the other two build outs that we did after our main one, we still did it ourselves, thinking that it was a smart thing to do because it was cheaper and it ended up taking longer and probably ended up costing us more. I mean, on that topic, like, I think the contract negotiation, the slowing down the front end and planning is absolutely critical. Like, the market's flooded with brand new breweries, but it's also flooded with tons of suppliers, and they're not all alike. Um, really, don't hesitate to ask for things in your contract to pit suppliers against each other to be a savvy buyer, because there's a lot of people that are hungry for your business, and you're, I mean, you're, you're going to put a lot of capital out there, and people want to be like your supplier. Uh, do your homework. I mean, call people that they've done work with. Uh, make this this industry is very very small. I mean, in just ten minutes, we've already shared a bunch of things that you know just about operating that you know it's 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 almost an industry standard. So you know, spend some time, read your contracts before you sign them. Know what you're getting into because there are pitfalls. Like there's you know a lot of them will exclude process piping or integration or placement where you'll have three days to offload all this equipment when it shows up. I mean, there's a lot of dotted line stuff that can really get you in the end. So. Now, um, taking a little, bit, uh, a little bit of a turn here, talking about uh, building your brewery. How did you raise the capital to build, build your brewery, and is there anything that you possibly could have done differently? So Gate City started, and I, I believe that we're still the only one that did this. Uh, we started as an alternate proprietorship. We're, it took a while to get it to take it up um, the state side to make sure that you know we could still we could do this here. And what an alternating proprietorship is is basically you sublease space from another brewery, you buy equipment, you put it in there, you're brewing your own product, but you're doing it on someone else's in someone else's space. You're just subleasing a little corner of their brewery. So we had a we had a brewery that was um, not in a bad in bad shape financially, but they needed some they needed some help. So we offered to buy them a little another a bigger electric system in exchange for us to do this alternating proprietorship. And what that did for us was it allowed us to get a signed lease because you're going to need one of those before you can start your brewer's notice. And that takes anywhere from eight, it could be up to 14 months to get your brewer's notice um, through with the feds and go through all that process. But you got out of that signed lease and no one's giving you free rent. So what this allowed us to do was start that, um, start that process with our licensing, get a system set up, small system we had two little fermenters in a corner over at reformation in woodstock and we would go in there pat my partner and i would go in there at four o'clock in the morning on a saturday we'd fill up our fermenters and we'd go home um and what that did for us is it it allowed us to start number one but then also allowed us to build somewhat of a trap track record so that we could then go out to the investors that we were able to secure to raise the money that we needed to to build out here, get the lease signed here, get the equipment and the construction going here. Um, and I do, I am, I, do, I am pretty sure that I'm the only one in Georgia that's actually done that, the alternating proprietorship. CG, I'm going to direct this one to you because I think you guys are the ones that have had to deal with it the most recently. Uh, we've kind of joked that we're going to start a pool from the date a brewery originally says they're going to open and the spread there <laughs> of when they actually do open. So we have yet to see one that's able to make their initial target. And any time we talk to someone, we talked to Kerry Falcone quite a bit about the, the headaches that you guys had. You wanted to open, you were ready to move forward. So what are some of the pitfalls that people can expect along this process? And is there a good way to gauge kind of how long it, it realistically will take to open your brewery once you start? Well, I mean, the pitfalls vary from the architect you hire to the GC to the weather to the local municipality that you're actually permitting everything. Um, you, you can forecast, you can get your magic eight ball out, you can plant it as much as you can, but there's still, I mean, until you're out of the dirt, there's, there's a lot of variability with the schedule. And until you've cleared a lot of city and municipal permitting, you know, there's still a lot of variability. Um, one of the pitfalls we didn't really forecast in Atlanta was uh, the, the health department. And, uh, you know, we, did, we thought we did everything with uh, all of our T's crossed and our I's dotted, but they came in at the last minute after we had certificate of occupancy, and they said, oh, by the way, you have to do about $60,000 in upgrades before you can even open this restaurant. And, you know, here we are, we're thinking it's just a walkthrough, and we're going to be golden, and then it was just a fire drill. Um, so CJ, correct me if I'm wrong, but these things, especially with the health department, can get uh, nitpicky. 
uh, the spacing on handrails on stairways, different things like that. So yeah. th- there's really a lot that you have to look out for there, correct? It, yes, and it wasn't it wasn't black and white. It was it was very uh, objective. And uh, I, I guess my my advice to anyone getting into this, you know, never confront building officials in a. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> right. <laughs> You know, they're, they're always right. If they're not a beer fan, tough shit. Um, yeah. Yeah. And just, just be as generous as you can and, and act like you don't know anything and let them do a lot of the speaking and, and kind of guide them to solutions that you want through your questioning. Yeah, I would say that it's important to know with some of the permitting that even when you get an approval, a pre-approval on a plan, and this is definitely true with DPH, public health, that that pre-approval is signed off by someone who is not, in fact, the person who comes and inspects it. And, in fact, that pre-approval has no bearing whatsoever on the final inspection. And that happens in a couple of cases. So it's important to know that even though a pre-approval might be required and you go in and you send your plans in and they're approved, that doesn't actually mean that you're approved and that someone's going to come in and see the thing that's on your plan and go, that's fine. They might see the thing that's on your plan and go, eh, no, it's not fine. And so that's something to just be mindful of. And then the other thing that CJ did that I thought was really smart, and I'm interested to hear if you think it was really smart still, what he did is on the, in the restaurant side and the brewing side, they did two different COs. So they permitted them separately. And so having the CO on the brewing side meant that they could start brewing five weeks before the restaurant opened, which is about what you need, and really maximize that space. And I thought that that was pretty brilliant. And I'm assuming that you still think it was brilliant? <laughs> Say yes. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it was. It was, so it, it was great until uh, one of our restaurant bathrooms was tied to our brewery, and oh, so <laughs> and then it got. It, it was great because we got to start brewing. Uh, you know, almost three months prior to the restaurant opening, so recipes were good, beer selection was good, quantities were good, but it was. Uh, I mean, it added another element of uh, confusion for all the inspectors coming through the property. Naturally, most breweries are started by brewers, but uh, being a great brewer doesn't necessarily equate to being able to run a commercial brewery. I think we've seen all examples of that before. So what types of people outside of brewers do you need or should have on your team as you start to ramp up your business? I'll go with that. Uh, So Hop Alley is just myself, and when we opened Curry, it it was kind of a challenge because I do the brewing. Uh, I do all the brewing at Hop Alley, and then I oversee the brewing at Curry. Um, so running two locations in two different states, even though it's only about a, two hours apart, uh, I needed some help. So with Curry, I actually uh, got a good buddy of mine, and they say not to go into business with your friends, and I normally would agree with that. Uh, but he was an investment banker, uh, my buddy JT, and he's a co-owner of Curry. And he, me and him work, and we still work really well because he knows nothing about what I do, and I know nothing about what he does, right? So we're, we're the great yin and yang. Um, that guy could sit around and, and just talk banker language that I just am like, okay, yeah, just give me a beer, shut up. And where I start naming off recipes and glycol and whatnot, and he looks at me, he's like, yeah, you just go do whatever you want to do. So that's been a big help for me. Uh, And, you know, I talking about, you know, what Jason was saying, you know, when he came, he actually came to me and said, you know, I hear you're opening this other brewery. I said, yeah, he goes, I want in. I said, all right. He goes, how much do you want? I said, well, nothing. I want sweat equity. And he was like, are you serious? I said, yeah, be honest. I just need, would like to help. And what you do being the CFO running, handling all the permitting, handling all the taxes would just take a huge load off my back. And for that, you know, I don't. I'm going to ask you to put in money if you want want to, but I really just want the sweat equity. And we've been doing that now for a little over two years with Curry, and it's worked out great. So that's one thing, you know, if if you do have a business partner, having two brewers that are going in and opening a brewery, well, yeah, it's great. You could bounce ideas off each other, but someone's going to win that battle, and someone's probably going to get pretty upset about it to where if you get someone who is completely opposite and doesn't have the – skill set that you do would make your life a lot easier if you are looking for some type of partner or an investor. So we have a good mix at Jekyll as well. Um, I thought I made good beer. The neighbors drank it. 
but I knew it wasn't good enough to go to market with, so I went and found what I felt was the best brewery I could find and someone that I liked a lot and brought him in as a partner. Um, but then the other thing we did, I think, that helped us to be very successful was in our organization documents, um, with the help of Taylor's firm, you know, we made really clear contractually who was Alpha, right? So everyone got a say-so, but everybody knew, you know, if, if we didn't agree how it would go. Um, and that's, it's actually been really helpful to us. I would also, what I find when I talk to brewers is that for the most part, brewers are mechanically inclined. If you are not a brewer who's mechanically inclined, like if you can't fix a pump or jerry-rig a thingy or do some welding or something or whatever has to happen to continue to make that production line work, if you have to hire someone to do that every single time something breaks, you'll be hiring someone like every other day. And so that was one thing and that I... And you'll be down a lot. <laughs> right? Like, you can't afford to have, like, you can't afford to hire someone because you can't afford to wait, and you can't afford to hire someone because it's too expensive. So having someone who's mechanically inc inclined, who can, like, take apart a car and put it back together is crucial. And I see more and more kind of business guys getting into this business because they see that it's something that's, like, cool and fun, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of, if you can't make beer, then you're not making money, and it can really slow you down if you don't know how to fix you know, basic stuff and even complicated stuff. Yeah, I've always said uh, that, uh, you know, you need a Steve Jobs to kind of get that vision and set that vision, but you also need a Steve Wozniak to get it done. So you kind of <laughs> need that kind of yin and yang to make sure that things will happen. Well, so, I yeah. think to Mike's point, too, it's really important, especially if you're not going it alone, and if you are, heaven help you. Um, <laughs> but uh, if you have a partner or partners in place, it's, re it's really important, and I really like that idea about putting that in the operating agreement. <laughs> having each one of you know like okay you're gonna wear this hat and you're gonna wear this hat and you're gonna disagree a lot I mean it is as close to a marriage as hell it's almost more crazy than my marriage but at the same time it's awesome because you can scream at each other you can have you can knock it out you can have those conversations but at the end of the day you kind of have your defined roles and those are hard to put in place because yeah if you both brew beer you both still want to brew beer I've stepped away from it because that's where I was needed on from more on the business side than on the brewery side. We, we were able to take care of that. And so I moved into this other role a little reluctantly, but it, you do what you have to do for the business. And so everyone that's involved with that needs to understand that if you want it to be successful, then you better be able to say, okay, I'm not going to get in my way all the time. I'm going to have to move over and do this if I need to do this because it has to be done. We're going to ask a couple questions that some people posed on the uh, pre-event survey they sent to us. Then we're going to open up the floor uh, for some questions here from our attendees. So this is kind of a two-part question. Uh, one question that we received was, or one thing we noticed on the survey was that over 50% of attendees uh, said they have less than a year of brewing experience uh, before looking to start their brewery. So as someone goes into starting a brewery, how much experience, or maybe a better question, is what type of experience would they need before they start? And as the second part of that, what is something that even an experienced home brewer may not know or be exposed to before starting their brewery? Um, so I, I'm not going to name names uh, for obvious reasons, but I think we're in our third year of Hop Alley or something like that, and I got a call from uh, a company that we deal with over at Waffler chemicals and he says hey i got a guy who is looking to start up a brewery do you mind if he comes in and shadows you he wants to kind of see your system he's got the same setup that you do i say okay great so the guy comes in that morning uh comes in about seven we start brewing and he's shadowing me and he's asking me questions and kind of find it a little odd and uh some of the questions that he was asking me and i said well when you guys you know when you look in a search a brewery he goes well it's we're, it's being built right now I said, okay, well, who do you got brewing for you? And he goes, well, I'm doing the brewing. Said, All right, that's fine. And then I get to the question of how do you carbonate beer? Excuse me? You're, you're opening a brewery and you don't know how to carbonate beer? And so I kind of walked him through the process, helped him out a little bit. And to that point, as a home brewer, and I've seen a lot of home brewers, they get the brewing concept, right? It's easy, or for the most part. It's easy to brew. It's a little more difficult to make good beer and it's even more difficult to make that same beer over and over the seller side is where it gets most of you guys the cellaring is very 
it, it's challenging for a home brewer because they don't get it, right? And it's no, no fault of their own. They just aren't used to the equipment. They're not used to the carbonation. They're not used to the, if you're having a candy line, a keg cleaner or whatnot. It's just, it's, unless you've never done it, you don't know it. So that's one thing that I always tell people, even, even me, you know, when we've started up, I started up the big system at Sweetwater Forum. Um, it, it's, you know how to brew, you know how to brew beer. It's learning your system. And as what Nancy said, your system's going to break. So you better know your system because you're going to need to be able to fix it. I mean, we bought brand new equipment and everything's broke for the most part. Pumps, uh, boilers, burners valves you got to know how to fix it but at the same time again it's brewing it's mash it's kettle it's transfer right get to know your seller side get to know with some guy that owns a brewery or that knows that side and pick his brain because that's what's going to bite you in the butt that's where a lot of your mistakes that i see made on for new brewers coming up and starting is that yeast is the carbonation is the sanitary I mean, a lot of these guys come in and they want to do, you know, Brett beers and stuff like that. Well, how do you know how to clean that? Do you know what you need to do to make sure that you're not getting Brett in every beer? There's a great brewery out in Oregon that was not a Brett brewery. That is now a 100% Brett brewery (laughs) for reasons of sanitation. So that's one thing I would say is try to get to know your seller side. If, If you're really serious on being the brewer and being your brewmaster, know the seller side. All right, so the next question we have here, uh, did any of you use a brewery consultant to start up your brewery? Uh, If you did, did you think that was helpful? If you did not, is it something you would do if you started over again? I'll start with this one. So I bought a book from Brewers Association called How to Start a Brewery. (laughs) And I spent $80 on this soft cover book that was about three quarters of an inch inch thick and uh, took it on vacation and read it. And I, I thought I knew it all. Um, no consultant uh, could have learned different things. You know, the, the, this community is friendly. If you're in it, you're you're in it to your neck. You know, the other people in the community are going to help you out. The same way I went to Brandon and asked him questions when we started. We do that with other people now. We do contract brewing for for small startups to help them get going if that's an option they wanted to go after. Um, so coincidentally, in that book, little fun story. I got to the section on sales and marketing, and this book was written probably in 2009 or 2010, and the sales and marketing section said, oh, the great thing about craft beer, you don't have to market, and you don't have to worry about sales expense, right, because it's down home, and um, your, your local neighborhood's going to come in and get it, and I thought, oh, that's great, so I left that out of the budget. <laughs> And now we have 6,000 breweries, and you have to market, and you have to sell, right? Different, different format. Um, turns out that chapter was actually written by, uh, by a local Georgia restaurateur. Um, so, yeah, good story. You said you were asking Brandon for questions, but it sounds like he was holding out on you a little bit there. So I'm not sure if you'd go to this. <laughs> Nancy, a question for you. Uh, As the executive director of the Guild, can you just tell everyone here, uh, most probably no, but uh, what is the Guild about for new brewers? Uh, What's it take to become a member, and uh, what benefits would they see in becoming a member? Yeah, so the Guild, we're your trade association, uh, which means that um, I represent brewers um, at state regulatory agencies, federal regulatory agencies, and also at the state capitol. Guilds exist in every state. Uh, in this state, we have 97% membership. That are the 3% sucks. Not really. They're wonderful people. Um, so in order to join the guild to be a brewery and planning, you do have to have your TTB license applied for. That's the main criteria. Uh, it is a mere $250. And then for your first year, it's just 500 bucks. Um, and more or less, the most important thing that it provides is my cell phone number, which can be used for good or evil. Um, so, I mean, I spend a lot of time on the phone with brewers asking questions. While they were speaking up here, I was answering a question about the Department of Public Health for a brewery that it called me. I also was texting Brian, asking him to bring me a beer, so there's ups and downs. Um, <laughs> So there's, there's a lot of things that we do for members. We do have quarterly meetings. We kind of bring you into the community. We uh, publish a 250-page regulatory handbook every summer that these guys just love. 
<laughs> um, and, and then provide uh, to be a liaison between you and any number of state and federal agencies as well. Basically, I answer questions. That's my main job. Thanks so much for the info. We're going to open this up to questions now. We'll just kind of gauge questions on how long they keep coming and until we're told to wrap up here. Now, this question is for Brandon. You talked about uh, getting to know your seller. Uh, what is your opinion, and also the brewers and professionals around the table, of formal brewery education like Siebel's and so forth? Uh, I don't know. I always grew up on the School of Hard Knocks. I, I, in the construction industry, I grew up starting in college as a superintendent uh, and worked my way through there to get a higher higher pay and better job and then went into the brewing industry and started at the bottom at Sweetwater uh, as a brewer and it, it, kind of a to give a funny story about that there was a brewery that opened up right about the time we did and actually the brewer works for me now uh, and him and the owner got into it uh, over I, it was something stupid about yeast and one went to the Siebel Institute and the other was a, a home brewer that had quite a bit of experience brewing with other breweries. Well, the home brewer was right due to experience to where, you know, one guy was in a, read it in a book about how this yeast should perform. So I've always been under the impression of, you know, get in there and if it, if it takes, you know, some sweat equity to to learn to work for free to do what you need to do, I always will take that route. That's when I, when we get applicants in, I look at job experience, not education. Uh, three part question: What was the best piece of equipment you ever bought? What was the worst piece of equipment you ever bought? And what was the biggest bottleneck equipment wise that you ever had to deal with? Canning wine. Don't say worst. We are being recorded. <laughs> Just go with best. <laughs> Canning wine for all three. So vague. So the, can, the canning line at all, all three. for all of them. I would say the, the, the graduate piece of equipment is the centrifuge. Like that's when when somebody buys a centrifuge, I'm like, oh, you're getting serious. Like, yeah, what's, that, what's that like? <laughs> uh, I like the keg washer. That's a nice little thing. We that helps out a lot. Um, it. it the keg washer is awesome. The boiler was by far the most expensive thing that I was not prepared for. <laughs> the boiler and installation. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that on the boiler. Our centrifuge was the best piece of equipment we bought. You, you don't really buy one when you're not making enough beer, and then you get making enough beer, and you buy a centrifuge, and the same effort, you get a whole lot more beer with better quality. So that was definitely the best one for us. Um, Probably the worst thing we ever bought was a plate and frame filter, the opposite of what the centrifuge did for us. You know, it was just a piece of junk. You bought a lot of stuff. Oh, I, got, I got one more. Um, the very first piece of equipment we ever bought was a yeast propagator. <laughs> a full-on, like, Sankey keg, like, converted into a yeast propagator that was probably about 16, 1,700 bucks. And... It was rolling around upstairs the other day, and I was like, we still have never used this thing. Because <laughs> there's other things that you can do to, to propagate without even doing this thing. Kind of a, a follow-up question. Go ahead, CJ. Sorry about that. Pro probably like a, a VFD-driven air compressor. Most people will buy like seven or $8,000 air compressor or even cheaper that's reciprocating, and it's either all or nothing. So if you're going to run that one can and actuate that one valve, your compressor's turning on. But... With the VFD compressor, I mean, we're able to trim quite a bit of electricity usage. Uh, and centrifuge is pretty good, too. So Everything else is headaches. How much does a VFD compressor cost? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys are that one. It's 15 horsepower VFD compressor you probably get for like nine to nine to $11,000. Nice. Reciprocating is probably yeah. like seven to eight. I remember when I found out my first air compressor was going to cost me twelve grand yeah. when we had five Home Depot DeWalt uprights. <laughs> All daisy chained together. <laughs> and now I think it's a good price, so that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just ask your compressor guy to do the like the ROI for your right. electricity usage. They all know it, so they'll do it. Cool. Yeah, you'll get used real you'll get used to big numbers real fast. <laughs> your your perception of what's expensive is skewed considerably after you get into this business. It's good good suppliers, like just keep them in your back pocket because they're few and far between. Absolutely. 
question for all of you. Um, about how much percentage of your beer are you giving away or throwing away? Depends how many festivals are that season. <laughs> and how many boys you have. Right. <laughs> Me and Michael were just talking about this. Our number one uh, beer consumer is your employee. <laughs> and yourself after a long, long day as well. So. That's true. I, mean, I think it's a good question. Like, what's the what's your throwaway percentage? Like, what do you budget for to go? Like, I'm gonna have to dump slash comp slash. Like, what do you? Yeah, what's we, your target? We kind of lump it all together. So throwaway includes production waste, right? From your from the amount that you put off the brew house to what you got into package to what we actually got paid for, and and we're generally in the 88 or 89 percent of what we start with is what we actually sold. Um, and our our employees are our number one customer, um, and they're free in our you know in our tap room. We don't charge them to drink, and they take full advantage of it. And <laughs> it's it's fine, right? I mean, it is what it is. Um, but also to that same point, and I didn't hear anybody mention this. There must not be anyone here trying to sell insurance. When we started, we had um, product contamination insurance and coverage on spoilage. Um, and it was really important to us because we made a drastic mistake and our entire brewery went bad. Every drop of beer we had in our tanks um, was, was um, filled with bacteria and we couldn't send it to market, obviously. So we had to drain all of our tanks. And this is when our, financially our backs were against the wall. And Josh, our brewmaster, nudged me and he said, hey, didn't you say we had insurance for that? And I called the insurance company and I got a check for every drop of beer as if I sold it out the back door um, overnight. It was, it was wonderful. And it was a lesson learned, right? I mean, there's just lessons that happen. And we, we, so we're talking about beer waste. We dumped every tank we had, and that was waste. And that insurance coverage was so valuable to us. Um, it happened twice more, uh, not intentionally. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then they, they took that coverage away from me. <laughs> and we never made a mistake since so it was... <laughs> but it's super valuable and it's out there and I think we paid like 20 bucks a month for this spoilage addendum to our policy so it was uh, think about it somewhat related to the uh, to the production how much you serve how much you dump in that uh, how much trouble was it figuring out your production schedule and what kind of timeline do you see, is, or is there an average timeline from brew day to hitting the taps in your tap room? Yeah, so I'll touch on that first and then let these guys take it. it, it for me, it's really about what type of person you are, right? I'm, I'm a data-driven guy. I love spreadsheets. Production scheduling is a piece of cake. You know, and, and from when we made our first beer to when it went on taps was exactly what I thought it would be. Um, so it was easier for us because it was a personality thing. I've seen other breweries that aren't as comfortable with data, you know, and they're more artistic, and they struggle in those areas, and they miss their marks. I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yes. I'll say one thing with us. You know, it, it depends if you're focused on, you know, in-house sales or have a distributor. In our case, for Curry, we have five distributors and uh, obviously our tasting room. And it's kind of, I'll be honest, it's a pain in the ass because uh, our tasting room, our regular, our, one of our year-rounders outsells everything two to one. Uh, you go to two of our distributors and we have one beer that outsells everything, you know, two to one. And then another distributor has another beer. So it, it, knowing what your distributors want and knowing what your taproom sales is is very important because you don't want to be in a spot to where you have a distributor selling, let's just say, 50% of one brand. You have four brands to them, just throwing random numbers out there, and 50% is one sale. Well, you need to make sure that beer goes to them, or guess what? You're going to have a lot of issues with your sales and your distributor. You're going to piss your distributor off. You're going to piss those people off that are buying your beer, whether it be on or off-premise. And then... But you got to figure out, again, the other distributors. So keeping, going back to what Michael said, keeping a, a data sheet on what's selling, what needs to go, and it needs to be down to a day or two. You need to have about a three-day fluctuation to where, yeah, you know, if you have a yeast issue to where you normally think this beer takes 
seven days to ferment out and it now takes 10, you now need to be able to account for that and manage that. Because, again, if you don't, you're going to be making your retailers and your distributor upset, which is the last thing you want to do. I think on our end, uh, one of the best things that our distributor made us do um, was they, the, we, they would sit down with us and we had to do an annual business plan uh, prior to the upcoming year. And it was something that we knew internally that we needed to do, but uh, we were always, we're, we're still, we're really small. So we were able to pivot whenever we needed to pivot. And we would have an idea of what we wanted to do from a production standpoint, but also knew that there was a much, there was much more planning that could go, that could be put in place. And um, Pat, my partner and I, due to our distributor, had to sit down and actually lay out what the year looked like. Um, and it was great. It was a great exercise because it forced us to do what we knew, knew we needed to do, but didn't necessarily have the time to do. Uh, and that helped us a lot with coming up with what we we're going to at least be sending out to market. In turn, Pat was then able to take that, throw it back in the, into the brew house side and figure out, okay, we know that we need to do this. We know what our goals are here. We know what the distributor wants. So we ha- will have these windows there to then be able to fit in whatever new stuff we might want to put in, especially with our production tanks. So it was a, it was a, it's been a very long learning process for us. Plus, we're extremely overly cautious about rushing something through or putting something out that's not ready. So we would, we probably could have gotten more out of our seller than we, I know we could have, than we did. But I'll accept that because we were overly cautious with it and knew that what went out was what we knew we needed it to be. Um, and as we are, as we move forward and get more comfortable with it and we can streamline some things and do some better planning. It allows us to really work that seller as, as efficiently as we possibly can. Yeah, I mean, I would say generally understanding the difference between push and pull is really important. Sometimes you're pushing to your wholesaler and all you're doing is filling pipeline. There's not an actual customer on the back end. You're filling the 30-day inventory that the wholesaler wants and the 15-day inventory that the retailer wants, and you're not actually getting a customer on the, on the end that's pulling. And so understanding the distance between you and a customer when you're going through distribution is a really long distance and understanding that relationship is very difficult to do and when you're in your tasting room it's really straightforward and so just being mindful to never short your tasting room in order to fill someone else's pipeline right you want to make sure that everything that you're doing is requiring a customer to pull and whether they're pulling from your tasting room or they're pulling from a or pulling from a shelf You just want to make sure that you're creating, you're you're putting your resources in the right place. Well, I mean, beer style plays into flexibility, too. If you are a home brewer that makes the most fantastic lagers and pilsners, well, you're not going to be able to react nearly as fast as somebody making ales and just, you know, non-dry hopped beers. So, yeah. And you don't really know what's going to sell when you have no market yet. On that question, how much of it is what's going to sell as opposed to driving the market. Uh, there's a brewery down in, in Hapeville, Arches Brewing, uh, that is lager-focused. They seem to be doing well. They're really driving that. Uh, what's the opportunity out there right now for a brewery to drive the styles? I mean, that's, These guys would love to know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I've, I've been to countless breweries, and their number one seller is a brand that they are not excited about, but yeah. the public loves it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I agree with that. There's a lot that goes into play with that, too. I haven't heard you guys talk a lot about the mafia. I mean, our wholesalers. (laughs) (laughs) And... And, yeah, exactly. We, you know, and the plan is safe. The, the portfolio, the products that they have put together plays in, in part with that whole formula as well. Um, we, we used to really pay attention to what, it, what they wanted as well. Um, we don't so much anymore and that and that really comes into play with like one-offs like when we first came to market our plan was not really have uh you know um flagship beers we just wanted to turn new stuff out all the time and this was four years ago we we're talking to our distributor and they're like no no no, no. you'll never you, the market will never like that you don't want to do that so we made a stupid decision and listened to them and we came out with flag flagship beers which were great and what the market do <laughs> now everybody wants the new thing you know they love flagship beers but it's always what's new what's new you always have to have something else out there to kind of interject or energize that market um and we being as small as we are now we've decided this year we're gonna we're gonna do that like we'll have our 
one or two flagship beers that are out in market, but it's going to be more of with our new canning line coming in and bringing that all in house. Like, okay, we're going to can, we're going to can 150 cases of this and send it out. When it's gone, it's gone. That's it. We're going to send 14, 28 kegs of this out. When it's gone, it's gone. That's it. Um, and so, you know, it, it's a lot. It's an education. It's what are you comfortable with? What are you familiar with? What do you want to do? What do people want you to do? And then trying to figure out how you can start building up your own identity once you learn this crazy, crazy market that is the beer world. And to talk to a little bit about how important your tap room is, you know, Michael, Brian, I know you guys have a lot of one-offs in your tap room, and you've really expanded on that too at Jekyll uh, over the past uh, few months or so. H- how important is that to, to, for your R&D and to make sure that your guys are on top of things and keeping your brewers active and interested in those types of things? Yeah, so for us, our tap room serves a great purpose. We have 26 different taps there, which I think is more than any of the other breweries in Georgia. Um, and, it, and it keeps our staff busy, right? Think about 26 different taps of your own products and how you're constantly having to recreate and recreate and recreate. Josh has come up with over 300 different beers since we opened four years ago. I mean, that's insane. And he, he comes to me, and I just see the bags under his eyes. You know, he's out of ideas. And then we throw something else down, and he comes up with 20 more. It's really cool on that side. Um, the, the tap room part is super important. We put 26 products up, and I turn and I look. I brought a guy in the other day, and I wanted him to taste our cider. We started getting into hard cider just for our tap room. And went to get the cider, and it was gone. It had only been up for a day. And I asked the guys where it went, and it turned out we went and ran the numbers on it. It was the fastest-moving product we ever had. I've never seen anybody drink a cider before. I, it just blew my mind. <laughs> so it's super important in that regard, right? I mean, things are happening that you had no idea. We're, you know, we distribute on the Bud Network, and one of the smartest things I thought I had ever heard, um, Brian almost just said it there, Leon Farmer had said to me, he said, you never know what the market's going to do. And he, he used Budweiser as the example. They brought... Um, He said, you can bring a great product and the market might not take it, and you can bring crap and the market might love it. And he mentioned something made with strawberry that ended with Rita when he was referencing that because they sell a ton of it, you know, and it didn't make any sense. Um, Super important. But also as equally important, which I don't have, that these guys do have is the walkability part, right? I mean, I'm mouth-watering for walkability, and, you know, we stuck ourselves back near a greenway off the beaten path because we got 12 months of free rent right so is what it is yeah um we were we were two days away from signing a lease up uh kind of where abbey the whole holy goats is now if you're familiar with that a little business park up near alpharetta basically on the road between roswell and alpharetta before we got our landlord to agree to get his head wrapped around uh, this space here. So uh, when we signed our lease here, we we immediately shifted into it's going to be, our tap room is going to be what we focus on. And we intentionally did that. Um, And it's worked out well for us. It's basically paid the bills for the last two and a half, three years. Just this year, we're starting to actually put our our heads down and kind of look at the distribution side. Um, Because the tap rooms performs good, well enough for us uh, to where we need this other other piece of revenue that we can go focus on. Um, but it's been great from a beer standpoint because, like Mike said, it gives the brewers something fun to do. It gives us a good education opportunity for people that work upstairs in our production space um, for us to teach them and coach them on the process and give them some buy-in on what might end up on the board down here. So we have a one-barrel system, we have a seven-barrel system, and we have a 30-barrel system. 30 barrels for all our production stuff. The seven barrel we kept from our old brew days, and the one barrel is my partner Pat's old uh, system from his garage. So we start on that one. We'll sit down with our employees, let them run through some recipes. We'll kind of coach them through what it is. And if it's decent, you know, we'll put it down on the top, top wall, and they love it, you know. So it, get, it keeps them energized. Um, and if it's crap, we tell them it's crap and we teach them why and we show them so it's a very good educational piece for us Uh, but it's great to be able to have 18 beers on tap and give people the opportunity to come in and try something different because we are in roswell it's we still do a lot of education here there's still a lot of the 
craft beer adverse people that are here that we get uh, in our tap room. And so we have to kind of run that span of, okay, we have something that's somewhat Miller Lite based for you. And we have something super crazy triple IPA for whoever else. Um, but it does, it does make it extremely interesting and exciting just to constantly be coming up with these different recipes. I think going on what Brian said, it's, uh, it's it's pretty interesting the fact that they have three three different systems and I think it's it's awesome. I wish we have two. We do a seven and an, a twenty, but to have something small like a three, uh, and then a production system. You know, especially if you're going with distribution, if you're going just straight in house and selling beer over the counter and not really sending any beer to the market. Uh, it, it's it's. I don't know if it's it's not vital, but it would it would be really nice to have something of that size because you know if you, let's say you you're opening up and you're opening up with a twenty or thirty barrel system, well, guess what? And you have twenty taps, twelve taps on, even as low as twelve taps. Not all those beers are going to move, right? So now you're sitting on a beer. Let's say you made an IPA that you love and you dumped all this money into it, right? With Citra hops, Equinox, or whatever. Um, and the rest of the world doesn't like it. Now you're sitting on 20, 30 barrels worth of IPA that isn't selling, that's now starting to lose the top flavor, that's just getting worse and worse, and guess what? It's going down the drain. It's one of the issues that I see with some breweries uh, to where, you know, it's a, a blessing and a curse at the same time, you know, having the brewery space, the cooperage or the, the the barrelage to be able to make a lot of beer and sell it to your distributor is great but at the same time if you can't scale that back and only put out a couple barrels just for your tasting room on an experimental beer it's it could wind up biting you in the butt if you you know or dump a beer down the drain if you have a lot of it when you don't need a lot of it thanks i actually have two questions the first one goes around wastewater and what sort of problems that you uh, encounter as you got your breweries up and running with municipal water systems and challenges with that. That's the first question. The second question is, do you have any loyalty programs, and how successful have those been? Those are surprisingly difficult questions, because loyalty programs create a whole host of legal issues that I'll let Taylor speak to. Um, You're not allowed to have coupons for alcohol in the state of Georgia, full stop. So loyalty programs can be challenging sometimes, but there's ways to do them. As far as wastewater, I'll let CJ talk about that. Oh, thanks, Nancy. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> the, the one thing I've noticed in Georgia is it vastly differs from location. Uh, Atlanta seems to be warming up to more and more restrictions. Uh, some of these <laughs> rural counties uh, don't really know much about the wastewater situation yet. Uh, it's you know I've seen from full-on very tight pH control to complete solids mitigation to just, you know, monitoring and reporting back. And so long as you stay under 15,000 barrels, you're not a heavy industrial user, so you really won't flag anything. Um, City of Atlanta is the major challenge. Um, Other cities have been easier to negotiate with. City of Atlanta seems to not know what they want and also have no desire to figure out what they want or negotiate. The, I mean, kind of. I mean, I've actually tried. Right. So I feel I feel confident saying that I, I've tried. Um, and so, City of Atlanta is a major challenge. Uh, if you're going into anywhere that's not City of Atlanta, then uh, I think putting you in touch with the local officials would be relatively easy to figure out. And the smaller you are, the easier it is. And so long as your pH isn't crazy, um, the one thing that you want to be mindful of is if you're going to be a larger brewery. And by larger, I would say. This is just me like spitballing, but more than 5,000 barrels a year. You need to be able to test your water as it's leaving the brewery. So don't bury that line where you can never get to it. Make sure that there's a way for you to pull samples and test it in case it ever comes up. Because what you don't want is someone to come in and say, we need to test your water. There's literally no way to do it. And now you're tearing up your concrete, trying to find a way to get into that line, the effluent line. So that's just one thing to be aware of. Yeah, when I was at Sweetwater, we had to test the water daily, pH. Uh, we had the inspector. I don't actually know if I ever saw the inspector. I was there for a couple of years. But, uh, yeah, we tested the, the water daily, pH-wise, and from what I gathered, 
was that they were more worried about organics going down the drain than there were chemicals. Uh, so, because they would, according to them, yeah, we're throwing caustic down there, which is, you know, a base, and then we're throwing some type of nitric or citric acid down there, and it'll eventually they'll go neutral at some point to where throwing hops, throwing grain down the, throwing hops or grain down the drain is what they were more worried about. Uh, now, in the rural counties, uh, <laughs> Going to that uh, up in Franklin, they know when we're brewing because we are a small town. We had to dump. We since we opened, we dumped one beer and we dumped thirty barrels down the drain. And the next day, I had the city at my door saying, "What the hell just happened? We just got inundated with a whole bunch of low pH, and our whole system smells like beer." <laughs> Yeah, nope, that wasn't us. <laughs> so it, it's good to know uh, the people who run that. We had to explain that, and they were all right with it after we a little coercing. But, yeah, uh, and then in Alpharetta, I, I've never seen or heard anything. So I'm kind of dumb in this space, and we just did what we wanted to do and then waited to see who said what. Um, and what that meant is there's two drains in our building, and one goes to a sewer system and one goes to a storm drain. And we learned what we couldn't put down the storm drains pretty quickly. Right? We were blowing our, our keg washer, which gets the chemicals that, that Brandon was talking about, was going outside and it was hitting one of the storm drains and getting into the local creek. And the city picked up on that pretty quick and they came by and said, hey, you know, we're picking up some organic matter. Um, just wanted to see what your guys' processes were. They looked at it. We switched that drain over into one that went to the city sewer system and they were cool. So um, we put yeast down the drain. We put um, trub and, and dry hop matter down our drain. And as long as it goes to the sewer system for the city, they were cool about it. Really what's been most important for us in that whole initiative is we've always kept a very open um, and good relationship with our local municipality. And um, it hasn't served us well with dollars um, that are measurable and tangible. But these types of things, it certainly helps. We don't want to do anything bad to the water table, right? I mean, we're very environmentally conscious with what we do, but we also don't want to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars if we don't have to. And as I talk to my friends that have breweries in Atlanta, they're getting hosed. I mean, it's they're having a really hard time. Um, New Realm um, it struggles with, with the city, um, it looks like to me. I should not put all you guys on the spot if anyone from the city wants to listen but the local municipality relationship is super important that's probably one of the most important things you guys could pick up from this if you move forward what mike just said is you you really have to make sure that you keep a very good relationship with all these municipalities because they can make or break you and it doesn't mean paying them off either no it doesn't mean paying them off it just means let the record show that's not what i meant yeah but uh but you do, you do need to keep a good relationship with them. Um, you know, doesn't mean you can't have lively conversation, but uh, just remember that if they want to hurt you, they can hurt you. Yeah, we're going through that right now with a, a second location of Curry, and Taylor can vouch for this. When we first opened Hop Alley, it was, it was a municipality that wanted to grow, it wanted to be Canton Street, it wanted to be Roswell. Uh, you know, Alpharetta, I th there was one restaurant right there on Main Street or something like that. So when we came in, it was open arms. Yeah, whatever you want, we'll do great. Now we're opening our second location there, and we've gone through three committees. Um, and, you know, the first committee is, is the planning committee, and they want to know how we're going to keep people from not walking in the street and getting hit. I mean, just stupid stuff like that. So. Lucky enough, we know a lot of people in the city where we could talk to them and, you know, you got to politic with them, right? So that's when you're opening your, your brew pub or brewery, that is huge. Know your, like Brian was saying, know your local elected officials, know your non-elected officials, and get them in goodwill. I mean, we've brought the guys in from Alpharetta, the city council, at Hop Alley to brew with us. We named the beer after them. I mean, it's just stupid stuff like that to do that makes them, puts a smile on their face. They bring all their buddies in, they're high five, and they're taking pictures with you behind the bar in the brewery, right? I mean, it's just little things like that that really go a long way. This one's for, uh, for Michael. You mentioned in passing that you don't get a ton of foot traffic where you're at. Do you do anything different to 
kind of counteract that, or do you do the same thing everybody else does and just find that the crowds will come and they're more than happy just to drive there? Yeah, we have good we have good capacity in terms of the we keep the seats full. Um, we're missing. Uh, someone asked about a loyalty program. I think that that's a gap that we have. There is no loyalty program in place. I'm trying to figure out how we how we do that best. Right? What serves the customer best? What serves us best? Um, we regularly do events to try and draw people in. If, whether it's a, uh, a a cornhole tournament, I think it's this Saturday. Check our social media if you guys are interested. We're having a a, a, a wiffle ball grand. Grand Slam tournament, right? I so, saw that on Facebook. That looked awesome. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so just cool stuff like that. We're constantly driving. Social media is so important to us um, and so important to our industry. You know, and that's kind of where you can where you can get up on, on what we're doing on all that stuff. But really, it's this being in, uh, in picking the right real estate with foot traffic is super important. I would have been hosed had I picked Main Street for our first brewery because we grew so fast and um, you know we would have been hosed uh, but now I know what size we are and I've got a better measure of what size we can be now I can go to Main Street and have a good idea of what size that's going to be right I mean we opened before SB 85 and you know selling beer out of your tap room just wasn't an option so we took we took the laws for what they were and uh, got what we got we didn't have any money, so you know our tap room has drop ceilings in it. It's super ugly. Did the best we could with it, and it's kind of cool because now it's who we are, right? I mean, we're all ugly. <laughs> speaking of, speaking about locations, uh, it seems to me that there's clusters of breweries in the metro area. Is that trend? What's causing the trend, and is it going to continue, or are we going to see? Uh, I'd like to start with that one. So, you know, the city of Atlanta had um, a statute where if you were a brewery, you had to be in an industrial zoned area. So it really was driven initially by what real estate was zoned as to where you could go. When we went to Alpharetta, Alpharetta was looking at um, um, the city of Atlanta for a guide um, and decided we could live in a light zoned, a light industrial zoned area. Um, now they seem to be opening up the books, right? No city currently has a plan, a city plan, that doesn't include a brewery in it of some sort. So they're completely pulling the, pulling the floodgates off of that. But I think that those trends were driven by real estate zones initially. Yeah, I think he's right. I do think that when we see nationwide, and we got to see in, in, in Georgia, but nationwide we see that cluster breweries do tend to work. That, that there is a... There is a level at which there, at which the competition actually becomes a problem, but that level is actually pretty hard to reach. Having three or four breweries within three miles of each other, two miles of each other, actually tends to increase business for everyone, not decrease. So cluster breweries do tend to work favorably as brewery districts, but that's just kind of nationwide data. Um, I think that I think that Michael's totally right that zoning has created some of that, and zoning should be based on kind of two factors. One, 53-foot trucks, and two, smell. Um, so if you are a brewery who needs 53-foot trucks to come in and out of your brewery all the time, right? You're, that's what you're using to send to your wholesale, and that's what you're using to get your grain and your raw materials in, then yeah, there's just a reality that you need to be in a space where those trucks can travel. Um, but if you're a smaller brewery, then there's a lot of flexibility as to where you can go. Um, but Generally, we see that when breweries are clustered, they do better. When when Gate City started up, we um, the city was going through a massive rezoning project. Uh, I don't even remember the name of it now, but we just happened to be lucky in the fact that we had started talking to them prior to that, and so they were able to put microbrewery wasn't even in the code. And so while they were going through this, we were able to lump we were we were able to convince them to put that in. Um, which was awesome because we were the first ones here. So we basically had to get all these, all these things done. Now you fast forward a couple years and city council and some of the local uh, business advo adv advocacy groups have gone to, Char uh, um, not Charleston, but um, Asheville. 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 And they're like, yeah, well, we want to turn Roswell into a mini Asheville. 
So now they're ulti- they're out there courting breweries to come to Ros. Don't come to Roswell. No. <laughs> <laughs> but they are they are out there, and they're they're we've had you know Abbey Holy Goat just opened, Variant Brewing just opened up, uh, from the Earth Brew Pub just opened up, all within the last year and a half. Uh, and I'm pretty sure, last I heard, they're planning on two to three more. We're gonna have a distillery uh, in the next two years. So, you know, it's something that the city is really focused on. I will say that uh, if we were still on the tour, tour model, I'd be extremely, extremely worried about that. But, um, you know, with the passing of SB 85, it's, it's, been all, it's been great. I mean, with Variant down the road, people will go to Variant, they'll come to us. They'll go to us, and then they'll go to Variant. So it's just, they've, and the city's created this uh, passport program with the local breweries to where you go to... You go to the visitor center and you get a pamphlet. You go hit all the, the three breweries and the one brew pub. They give you a stamp and then they have a commemorative glass that you pick up there at their tourist office. So the city's really embraced it. It's been cool the way the city's embraced it. But yeah, sometimes you're kind of like, all right, stop a minute. Like, <laughs> let's not get crazy here. <laughs> I've been to a couple of conferences recently. I already have an accountant. Sorry. <laughs> I've got an accounting question now. Um, so I've been to a couple of conferences, and one thing I would like to hear from you guys is on the quality control. Michael, you talked a little bit about it. Uh, I've sat in on a couple of conferences where they get the chemist that comes out with the white coat, and they're talking about gloves and things they're spraying on and Bunsen burners and dumping batches and contamination. And to me, as a person that probably like a lot of you, have like, wouldn't it be cool to open a brewery? And then I hear all those things, and that's my scared straight moment. Like, there is no way I'm going to do that. So how important it is, is it for craft breweries as they're getting started to invest in quality control, uh, at, you know, everything that, you know, off flavors, bad beer, dumping batches? How important is that? I want to tack on, because when we were talking about the most important equipment that you bought, none of you mentioned lab equipment. Right? So if you guys no, could pitch good. the most important lab equipment that you've ever bought, that'd be great. Yeah, so those are all really good points. And one of the things I noticed from the moment I walked in this room was not once did we stop to talk about your beer has to be great, <laughs> right? You can't just make good beer. Your beer has to be great to be brought to market and representing Georgia beer. And if it's not, all of those nice things I said about you know, we're there for you and all that. It all goes out the window. <laughs> These guys will all tell you, if you're not interested in making great beer, then, then just stop. Um, the beer has to be great. So to Nancy's point, now you know what great beer is, and you can make great beer, um, and then you've got lab equipment you've got to buy. If you're willing to forego the expense of the lab equipment to drop in beer down the drain, you're tasting everything before you're putting it in a package, or you're tasting it before it's going off the dock. So that's how we started. We couldn't afford lab equipment. We didn't have a lab. No one wore a white coat. It was 115 degrees, and we wore tank tops. Um, but what we were willing to do every single time is we were willing to throw away the beer before we sent bad beer out to the market. And it was super important to us. Now, fortunately, we're finally in a position where we can buy lab equipment. I still don't have the sophisticated stuff other people have. I put a bigger expense in setting beer aside from every single batch and us going back through and tasting it. The professionals on site that could have good sensory and have good palates and we're tasting and understanding what's different from batch to batch to batch in terms of shelf life and where we can improve on DO levels. Um, that's kind of what we're doing now. We're still relying on the human tongue and smell and, and brain and then you know setting package aside. And then we go to other places, and they've got badass lab equipment, and we get really excited. You know, we just don't have that. That's not how we roll. But we'll put the beard on the drain in a second. Yeah, if you ever knew uh, Michael's Brewer Josh, they probably brew with the yeast off his beard like they do that road. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, as to Michael's point, you know, there's to a point, there's only so much I, I know or one of the other guys who brews that we know about chemistry so we're fortunate enough to where we have two really big breweries uh not too far from us one being oscar blues and the other being sierra nevada up in north carolina to where we can bring beer to them um that's one thing i would recommend doing is getting the good graces of 
a brewery with a, a, a good lab. Um, we do have test equipment, and the one thing you can do is test for DO. Uh, DO, especially when you're bringing uh, package to the marketplace, is huge. Uh, dissol- DO, if you don't know what that is, is dissolved oxygen. If you are sending beer uh, with a high dissolved oxygen content, it's going to go back quick. Um, and there's been issues with you know canning lines, mobile canning lines, uh, bottling. I haven't seen or heard of it that much, but there's been a lot of canning line issues coming out to where these DOs you'll see parts in the millions as opposed to where you're supposed to be parts in the billions, um, and that will ruin a beer quicker than you can believe. So and that, the canning line company won't tell you the truth. No, they always. won't. Always never test it independently. Yep, before you that buy. was actually. Uh, our first, so we bought our own canning line, but our first set of cans we ran through with a mobile canning company, and they claimed, you know, under 50 parts per billion. Oh, that's awesome, right? That's going to be shelf stable for months. Come to find out, we were like 700 parts per million. I mean, it was insane. So that beer lasted maybe, it had a, at the most, the 35, 40 day shelf life, and then we just pulled it out of the market. Uh, and to that note, don't be afraid to dump a beer, right? There's 6,000 breweries out there. There's a lot of good beer out there. These guys all make good beer. If you put a bad beer out to market that's infected, guess what? Your name's going to get tarnished. Dumping a couple thousand dollars of product down the drain, it hurts. It really hurts. But it's going to make you or at least keep money in your pocket down the drain or down the long run. It's again, it's just something you need to be able to make sure that that's in the back of your head one day is that, yeah, we're going to have to lose this product because it's not worth us putting in the market, not worth tarnishing our name. Because at this point, if let's say, you know, Gate City puts out a beer that's full of lacto or something like that, uh, that's not supposed to be. And guess what? I have now four or five other breweries that write in. A 20 mile radius that I could go pick it up. Not saying that they do that. I love beer is awesome, but uh, it, just to the just to the point. Yeah, just to the point. Just if you have to do it, do it. It's worth it in the long run. Yeah, to that point, um, we're still really small too. Uh, we do a lot of stuff by mouthfeel and, and flavor and taste and knowing what what it should be when it comes off. Um, but we do have a very good relationship with some of the bigger breweries in Atlanta that do have proper lab equipment that we will we can take stuff down and they'll test it for us, uh, which is awesome because we don't have the funds really to go out there and really build out a proper lab. Um, but it is, it is extremely important, and dumping a beer is a terrible thing to do, but you've got to do it. You have to. You have to. It's important also to know the difference between if you build a tasting room business and you're moving things through your tasting room very quickly, you may never know that you have DO problems until you start going through distribution and it's you know a six week, eight week problem. And so that's just something to be mindful of is that if you are building a tasting room business first and then going to the distribution, that you're gonna discover that you have problems that you didn't know you had. You were moving products so quickly straight from the brewery to the tap room and it was going fast enough that you never realized you had that shelf stability problem. And so when you make that transition, you could end up realizing that you've got problems that you had no idea that you had. And those are about shelf stability over the long term. So, you know, to that point, sorry, Siege, I didn't mean to jump in front of you. Siege. Go for it. I'm going to call you Siege. That's fine. Siege. <laughs> we, had, uh, we had a real life case of this. It was a year and a half ago. We have um, our flagship is pineapple or is, is hop dang diggity. And pineapple habanero hop dang diggity was a variation of that. And we put fresh pineapple in the beer after it's finished, which adds a lot of sugar. Um, and we didn't recognize our own problem. So we, were, we would take our IPA, blend it up, send it out to market, adding that sugar in. And what happened in the summer came along, and it started getting warm. And that sugar, some of the yeast left in the beer woke up, and they're like, hey, there's sugar here. Then the guy would buy a six-pack, and he'd put it in the back of his Jeep, and he'd be bri- driving home, and all of a sudden the temperature would go up about 10 degrees, and the caps would start popping off of all his beers because you know, the, the yeast were reactivated. Um, lens into the next story. It would have been cheaper to dump the beer 
or understand our problem before you know to having to pull it off the market. So we pulled that product completely off the market. Pineapple habanero hop dang diggity came completely out, empty the shelves. That was super expensive, but we didn't want people to buy beers that were popping. Um, bought our centrifuge, which spins all of the yeast out of our beer. We got pineapple habanero hop dang diggity back out into the market, but hard choices. Right? Mm-hmm. And good example there as to what we could have done with better QC equipment. Yeah, if you think if you think it's bad when someone personally attacks you on Facebook, <laughs> wait until it's your business. <laughs> CJ's got a bitchin' lab he'll let you guys use. Well, I mean, I think quality even extends beyond the lab. Like, I agree, I think DO measurements are, especially if you're going to go into packaged beer, it's probably, like, one of the number one things you need to have. Uh, But if you undersize infrastructure, if you can't hit your boil in time, if you can't cool your beer in time, if you can't maintain a mash temperature, I mean, you're you're not going to be able to correct some of those issues. And this sort of plays back to the hiring conversation. If you look at, you know, formerly educated brewers versus home brewers, there are certain sanitation processes and, and technical processes that are taught. Like in Germany, getting a brewing degree is akin to getting an engineering degree in the States. Like it's a, it's a very rigorous structure. So there's, there's a translation of like the hard knocks and the actual doing the labor because there's nothing glamorous about working in a brewery, but the technical know-how of, of you know, creating quality beer and maintaining it is, is just as essential as the equipment you have. I'm just curious. So you've mentioned social media a few times. Do you guys manage that all in house, or do you outsource that? I mean, how do you? That's that seems like that's a full time job in itself, especially for a small brewery. So our first social media manager was my wife, and she was awesome. Right? She did a really good job with it, and it took us uh, until our third and a half year to hire somebody in to do it, um, whose full time job is doing social media. That kind of goes along with the evolution of social media, though, I think, as well. Um, if I had to, to fire 90% of my staff, our social media guy would be in the last 10% surviving. <laughs> <laughs> it's that important to us. That's what I'm about. Yeah, we, we do it ourselves. We did hire a company, and out, we outsourced it, I think, for all of about two weeks, and then we fired them um, just because they didn't get the business to really get the beer but uh, we took it back over. It, it, Michael's absolutely right. It's you need to have someone, a marketing, of sort that does it for you. I mean, we try to do it. It's tough. It, it's it's hard to brew beer, make brewing schedules, orders, everything like that, and then yeah, yeah. Give. I mean, yeah. I mean, who could give up on Twitter? Yeah, you can't. We um, we have our. I guess she's our general manager who pretty much runs our tap room, um, who started out as a volunteer for us. Uh, she runs our, all of our social media stuff. Um, she's very good at it. She's grown to hate it because it's, because it is absolutely a, uh, 24 hour job. And then we're always telling her like, look, cause if you're not, if you're not, we don't want to inundate everybody with stuff, but you have to put something out. Um, and we don't want to put out crap. We try to put out quality, quirky, you know, kind of kitschy stuff. Uh, and I think she does a really good job of it. Now, when it comes to responding to things, um, I'm an administrator on our Facebook and Instagram accounts. So is my partner, Pat Rains. And then we also are very active on a lot of the beer blog groups, whether it be Facebook or Reddit or whatever. I'm not so much on Reddit because it's a little crazy. But um, um, we'll... we'll the two of us will respond because as the, as the owners, it's important to us to show that we have a presence there. Um, and we haven't been severely attacked on there, but there have th- been things that come up, like the fact that we have let children in our tap room. Like, for whatever reason, that became a massive issue on one of these groups. Um, and so we, we just try to take a deep breath and be very very careful about how you respond because you know the proper response can can be can pay dividends and the wrong one can absolutely crush you and then you know but we we don't let we don't we try not to let our internal staff deal with that even though sometimes they 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 get defensive which i kind of like because they take ownership (laughs) but yeah brian do you have any additional questions okay yeah yeah, cj doesn't want to talk about social media no i mean it's 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 a little bit different metric for us because we have a restaurant that we're associated with. So we have an in-house staff. Our GM responds to a lot of uh, 
Yelp reviews and Google reviews, but uh, I don't think we're treated quite like a brewery because there's a whole service element that's associated with it. And I mean, marketing's everything. Has anybody here had Treehouse beers? Like, they're good. Are they the best beer you've ever had in your world? <laughs> but they have phenomenal marketing. Like, there's, I mean, there's sort of this mystique about marketing, and you can make very good beers and market them, and they can be absolutely phenomenal. What's the line? I know that 50% of my marketing budget is, uh, is, totally useless but i don't know which 50 yeah. percent. right that's how it works <laughs> brewers nancy thank you so much for joining us today a round of applause please <laughs> thanks again for tuning in to this special episode of beer guys radio where we heard from professional brewers on what they wish they'd known before starting their brewery We hope this information is useful to you in starting your brewery. For additional information, be sure to visit georgiacraftbrewersguild.org. For additional insights, interviews, and information into the craft beer world, visit beerguysradio.com or subscribe to Beer Guys Radio on your favorite podcasting platform. Cheers.